Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Elliott, uh, president of Coherence LLC and developer of the Coherent Breathing Method. Thank you for your attention today. I'll be uh, walking you through coherent breathing and the brain, the big picture. This is work that's been uh, accomplished over the course of the period roughly 19 98 to present day. Here is the uh, roadmap that we'll try to make our way through during the time we have. Um, it begins with my search for the awakened mind brainwave pattern, uh, the protocol that would elicit that pattern. And to my meeting uh, of D. Edmondson, RN in 2000, uh, my finding the awakened mind brainwave pattern uh, in myself and the protocol to elicit that pattern in roughly 2003, uh, the writing of the new science of breath in 2005, uh, the revision of that to the second edition uh, shortly thereafter in 2006, um, the uh, prototyping of Valsavaway Pro with uh, J and J Engineering. Um, the first instance of Valsavaway Pro, the instrument uh, in 2008, and our ability to see uh, this phenomenon for the first time. Um, Valsavaway Pro 1.0 is launched in 2009. Um, my time and uh, discussions with Dr. Elsa Baer of uh, NeuroQuest in Chicago. The Search for the Wave in the Brain, um, a project um, a colleague and I undertook in roughly 2011. Um, I presented the results of that in 2013 at the Dallas ISNR. We'll talk more about that. Um, moving on to uh, my uh, search for personal resonance protocol uh, using Valsalva Wave 2.0 in 2016. Uh, my opportunity to instrument uh, Jade, a 12-year-old giraffe uh, at Dallas Zoo in 2017. Uh, very exciting results for me personally. And on to my current focus of uh, on essential hypertension and trying to uh, help eradicate uh, that underlying health condition uh, via education. First, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, key individuals that were involved in these uh, twists and turns along the way, pivotal moments. Uh, Anna Wise, um, who uh, brought uh, the Awakened Mind Brainwave training to the US. Dee Edmondson, of course, uh, we'll talk more about her in a moment. Uh, Michael Duquette of uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, Bob Grove, PhD uh, of J&J &J Engineering uh, at the time. Jan Hoover, J&J &J Engineering. Uh, Elsa Bear, PhD, uh, Tato Sakadze, PhD, and uh, the Dallas Zoo, uh, and Jay. Um, as mentioned, uh, uh, Anna Wise was the one that brought the Awakened Mind uh, to the US from uh, the UK. The Awakened Mind uh, is her trademark and that of her teacher uh, before her. Um, the term coherent breathing was coined by myself in 2005 uh, after acquiring the coherence.com domain name and before our completion of the writing of the new science of breath, coherent breathing for autonomic nervous system balance, uh, health and well being. Uh, coherent breathing is a registered trademark of Coherence OC and has been since inception in 2005. Uh, Valsalva Wave is also a registered trademark of Coherence LLC. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like for us to take a couple of minutes and um, experience coherent breathing. And to do this, I'd like to use Coherence Clock. Uh, coherence Clock will come up time and again during my presentation today. So uh, this is an opportunity to familiarize ourselves with what this is about. 
it's one of the early um, devices that uh, um, we developed in the 2006 timeframe, a 2008 copyright, um, that leads us to breathe coherently. And how this works is uh, it's a clock that allows us to breathe at the pace of five breaths per minute, um, six seconds uh, for exhalation and six seconds for inhalation. Once I start the clock, we'll see the hand move. Um, a few things about it. When we exhale, we want to relax deeply. And by that, I mean, let it all go. Oh. And here we're talking about internal tension. This is a key to, um, to coherent breathing and uh, an integral part of the protocol. So part, part one is learning to breathe at the nominal rate of five breaths per minute. Part two is learning to relax the six bridges, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll say, uh, just try to relax as deeply as possible internally. Um, the face, the tongue and throat, the hands, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, and the feet. So with that, I'll start. And uh, I might have a few words to say as we go along, but uh, please try the first few revolutions on your own. We'll try to go for 10 times a round. One more time. Now, you see these notes showing up during exhalation and inhalation. Uh, this is making note of the fact that when we breathe slowly, deeply, and rhythmically, it sets up a wave in the circulatory system that issues from the chest to the extremities during exhalation and returns from uh, the extremities to the chest during inhalation. This is a function of what I have called the thoracic pump. Um, we will uh, we'll see more about how that works as we move on. Uh, so take stock for a moment of how you feel after you after you breathe coherently for a couple of minutes. Maybe make a note of that. So the protocol proper is uh, most people know that it involves breathing at the nominal rate of five breaths per minute. 
uh, with equal periods of inhalation and exhalation. Technically, it is 5.1 breaths per minute, but uh, for general purposes, it's uh, five breaths per minute. Um, it also involves the conscious relaxation of the six bridges. And uh, these are body zones that, that I found during my search for the awakened mind brainwave pattern. And to elicit the meditative mind EEG and the awakened mind EEG, both are required. That is, breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. I found nominally five breaths per minute, but I could not go below that uh, without disturbing the awakened mind brainwave pattern. And the conscious relaxation of internal tension. And uh, the, uh, the primary zones that we have access to to achieve that are the hands, uh, sorry, the, the head and face, the tongue and throat, the hands, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, and the feet. Um, another thing I found during my search for uh, the protocol for eliciting personal resonance and for finding one's personal resonance uh, frequency is that diaphragm action should be sinusoidal. And uh, that's a little difficult to understand without watching a pendulum or a sine wave move. Uh, there is an instance of two bells on the coherent breathing channel on YouTube that uh, that demonstrates uh, a sinusoid moving up and down um, in synchrony with two bells. I encourage everyone to go there and have a look and train with that in that uh, it will allow you to understand what sinusoidal pacing of the diaphragm uh, feels like, and uh, you can incorporate that into your practice. Uh, practice this method in general 20 minutes per day uh, for three weeks straight. Uh, the primary learning track for coherent breathing is and always has been vocal instructive sequence. That is technically track two on the Sphere One CD that we began shipping in 2005 with, uh, with the new science of breath. And one does that uh, or tries to do that for every day for three weeks straight. And over that period of three weeks, it will, it will engram itself into the body-mind such that we will begin to understand and feel when we are not breathing this way. And that the body goes through a number of changes during this three-week period that uh, really enlighten us regarding what um, conscious coherent breathing can do for our, ourselves. And after that, we will desire to uh, to uh, reside in that state more than not, um, especially when we feel tension and angst sort of, uh, start to mount up and, uh, and we understand then that we can breathe to uh, mitigate that. So this is the protocol proper and has been uh, since the beginning with the, uh, with the addition of uh, the express mention of uh, sinusoidal pacing, which uh, is, uh, written in the New Science of Breath, but uh, re-emphasized as of 2016 with uh, personal resonance protocol. Um, as mentioned, Anna Wise uh, brought the Awakened Mind Brainwave training uh, from the UK uh, to, to the US and is the primary promoter of uh, studying uh, Awakened Mind and the elicitation of the Awakened Mind Brainwave pattern uh, here in the US. What that involves is learning to produce a, um, a symmetrical signal on the left and right sides of the brain at 01 and 02 locations um, that have this uh, relative pattern. That is, um, if we overlay this template on the EEG that's showing us uh, left and right sides simultaneously, it looks roughly like this in time. Um, these are the functional EEG bands uh, that are primarily of interest in psychophysiology today, uh, gamma being added a bit later in time. But the, uh, the idea and the understanding that Maxwell Cade and uh, Anna uh, came to is that this is the general EEG uh, pattern of the high-performing mind 
and uh, they were able to evaluate uh, Zen monks, um, high achievers in business, high achievers in academics, and determined that many of them did elicit this brainwave pattern more or less all the time. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, it is the basis of uh, what is generally referred to around the world now as the awakened mind brainwave pattern. Um, the image here is courtesy of the Institute for the Awakened Mind, as is the photograph of Anna Wise on the right. <clears throat> so as mentioned, the uh, elicitation of the awakened mind uh, requires breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. Nominally five breaths per minute was my uh, finding. And conscious relaxation of the six bridges such that we have command of both of those things. Um, we want to integrate them. That is, breathing has to come first because we, uh, we're not able to relax deeply without breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. So breathing must come first. And five or 10 minutes into breathing, uh, if you're doing it for the first time, you'll find your body automatically relaxing. It, it's almost like it's going down a stairway of relaxation. And what we do is we consciously aid that relaxation by learning, uh, focusing on and scanning and consciously relaxing the six bridges. Again, the six anatomical zones over which we have um, express um, dual control, that is, when we're not paying attention to these zones, the autonomic nervous system uh, manages them for us. And when we are, we have the ability to manage them consciously. Um, I've argued in my writing previously that these are the, uh, this is because these are the primary IO um, of the body, that is input output uh, locations of the body. And for that reason, we, are really, it's, it's necessary that we have dual control. Imagine uh, holding our breath underwater. Uh, and if, uh, if we didn't have dual control of the diaphragm. Um, in 2000, uh, I met D. Edmondson, uh, RN, B C I C E E G, a biofeedback professional and uh, an EEG neurofeedback professional. Um, we took our oldest son to D for neurofeedback for uh, ADD. This is how we met. And uh, from the time we walked in her door, uh, she and I uh, uh, rapidly bonded and uh, became uh, very close friends and colleagues, um, lasting to this day. Uh, so um, D um, was uh, very instrumental in, in uh, giving me a sounding board for the work I was doing on uh, awakened mind training. And um, likewise, uh, uh, she introduced uh, Evan, our oldest, to, to heart rate variability biofeedback the moment he walked in the door. And, uh, and when he was finished, uh, I tried it uh, immediately thereafter. And uh, as I was already breathing coherently, um, um, my heart rate variability uh, was uh, uh, promptly uh, and immediately uh, 36 beats uh, with uh, high coherence. So I bought an instrument from D that day and took it home and began integrating it into my own practice, which at that time included uh, EEG, uh, galvanic skin response, uh, body current to earth, and now heart rate variability. So the integration of that uh, helped me a lot and uh, moved me along the way in terms of uh, the evolution of coherent breathing. Now, we, uh, from that point onward, we began testing uh, coherent breathing with some of her clientele. And uh, when Respire 1 came out, uh, Respire 1 in prototype form uh, was integrated by D into her practice at large. And we, be, we began uh, recording the, the sessions and analyzing them, uh, sort of what they looked like before coherent breathing was introduced to clientele and what 
uh, happened afterwards. So um, what we saw was uh, really um, a dramatic increase in what I'll call neuroplasticity or the availability of uh, change that was demonstrated by these clients uh, once they had begun coherent breathing um, and uh, coaching and counseling with D. Um, many of them also with, uh, within eight to 12 minutes began to manifest the EEG of the meditative mind. So again, a good confirmation that uh, coherent breathing and deep relaxation uh, yielded the brainwave state of the meditative mind, uh, if not the awakened mind in her clients. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of those sessions. This is a 38 year old female that is uh, already trained in coherent breathing and is hooked up and this is the record of her session. And you can see from the outset here, uh, she's demonstra demonstrating the, uh, the general um, brainwave pattern of the meditative mind. That is beta, the, uh, the blue graph is low, relatively, relatively low. Uh, theta, the green graph is elevated, is higher amplitude uh, here than, than beta. And alpha is yet even larger. Uh, again, characteristic of the awakened mind brainwave pattern as well. Um, note the, uh, the amplitude here of these signals. Uh, they're on the order of five microvolts in amplitude. Um, at the bottom of the graph here, uh, we see a couple of other biomeasures, um, hand temperature and electrodermal response where D, uh, generally speaking, assesses all these simultaneously with her clientele and really has been a pioneer in the uh, application of multiple simultaneous forms of biofeedback with her clients in session. Um, this record and uh, a number of others from uh, D's clinic are documented in Coherent Breathing, the Definitive Method, which we published in 2008. Um, in 2006, uh, my first attendance of the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research, uh, I was introduced to Dr. Elsa Baer. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Baer and her husband um, um, were the founders of Baer and Baer in Chicago area and uh, later NeuroQuest. Uh, and uh, their principal uh, practice was uh, psychophysiology, uh, employing biofeedback and in particular neurofeedback. And over the years, Elsa and I stayed in touch and compared notes. And uh, with the launch of Valsavaway Pro in 2008, the, the prototype in 2009, the instrument 1.0 version, uh, she invited me to come to her clinic and teach her clinicians in the practice of coherent breathing with heart rate variability and Valsava Wave biofeedback, which is what Valsava Wave Pro does. Uh, not only does it do heart rate variability, but it also shows us what the blood is doing, uh, where uh, resonance is really a measure of the correlation between what the blood is doing and what the heart rate is doing. We'll talk more about that uh, in a few moments. Um, so, uh, I uh, got to know her clinicians quite well. And um, about 2011, Elsa called me and said, Steve, there's something I have to tell you. And I, I said, go ahead. And uh, she said, we are seeing alpha amplitude jump up in our trained clientele with a very first breath, with the very first breath using, using vocal instructive sequence the primary CD, training CD for learning how to breathe coherently. And again, the one that's included in uh, the new science of breath. And uh, we mused on the phone over how this can be. How is it that we see alpha pop up instantly with one inhalation and exhalation? However, 
the Valsaba wave itself is not evident in the EEG. Hmm, why not? So, as mentioned in 2009, we launched Valsaba Wave Pro 1.0. And what it allows us to do is see the Valsalva wave holistically. That's what this red wave is that you see on the screen now. And this red wave uh, is, uh, this is at the earlobe, a single clip attached to the earlobe. This is uh, observing blood moving uh, into the earlobe, filling the earlobe. That's this um, large red wave defined by the cardiac diastoles, the valleys here in the heartbeat. This is the um, respiratory arterial pressure wave uh, issuing from the thoracic pump uh, comprised of the lungs, the heart, and the sealed cavity of the chest. And then on top of that, we have the heartbeat, which is uh, the systole of that is rising during exhalation and then uh, the amplitude of the heartbeat is falling during inhalation, rising during exhalation, falling during inhalation, rising during exhalation. Now, you may observe here that the heartbeat rate is slowing as the heartbeat uh, is growing larger, what I refer to as bucket size growing larger. This is the heart moving blood from the, um, from the from the lungs through the left heart and into the arterial, arterial tree. Bucket size increasing, but the heart rate slowing as that happens. Then as we inhale, um, blood flow in the venous tree is maximized. And here we see the heart rate speeding up and the bucket size becoming less. So what's really going on here is during exhalation, blood flow in the arterial tree is being optimized and during inhalation, blood flow in the venous tree is being emphasized. And this goes on with every cycle of coherent breathing. Um, fortunately, uh, coherence was awarded the US patent for detection and biofeedback of the respiratory arterial pressure wave in 2009. And with that, we launched uh, the, the instrument commercially. So at this point, we uh, could clearly see the activity uh, breathing was inducing at the earlobe. Um, and uh, this uh, continued to puzzle as to, as to how this could be uh, seen at the earlobe, the nose, the tongue, uh, the temple, elsewhere that you could affix a sensor to the head but we weren't seeing direct evidence of it in the EEG. This is the, uh, my model of the circulatory system, not one we're taught in school, but um, I assert that in effect, uh, the larger picture of the circulatory system. You heard me refer to the thoracic pump uh, the thoracic pump is essentially the lungs and the heart bounded uh, by the uh, rib cage and the chest. This is a sealed cavity. Uh, therefore, uh, when uh, the diaphragm at the base of this cavity moves up and down, it changes the pressure inside this sealed cavity. When the diaphragm moves down, the pressure inside this cavity drops, becomes relatively negative, and that causes venous blood to return from the extremities through the vena cava, uh, through the right heart and into the lungs, filling the lungs with, uh, with venous blood, which <clears throat> is laden with carbon dioxide and needs to be exchanged for, uh, for oxygen. Then when we exhale the, uh, the blood in the lungs under relatively positive pressure, now the diaphragm moving up, the blood flows out of the lungs through the left heart, the arterial tree to the capillary circulation. And blood makes this uh, path, the five liters of blood in the body make this path roughly every minute. 
this as conventional uh, medical understanding. But in fact, when we augment uh, the flow of blood in the circulation with, with diaphragm movement of significant depth and rhythmicity, um, I argue that it roughly doubles the amount of blood flow per minute uh, in this loop. That is the five liters of blood we have in the body doesn't just circulate through the body one time per minute, but twice per minute. And that's really based on what I see here uh, in terms of uh, additive pressure differential, um, where in an untrained breather, all we see is a flat line, steady heartbeat rate, almost as though the breather is using a pace, a heart, uh, a pacemaker. And that is all that's causing the heart to beat. Whereas if we add significant diaphragm motion to that, we, uh, we start to see this wave begin to generate. And uh, with a little training, three weeks of training, uh, this is characteristic of what the Valsalva wave looks like at the earlobe or elsewhere in the body. This graphic over here shows us what it looks like in the venous tree, where the heartbeat itself is uh, barely visible, if at all, this being due to the very low pressure on the venous side um, of the circulatory system. Um, here, when we exhale, we see the blood rise in the earlobe. And then when we inhale, it falls in the earlobe, rising and falling with exhalation and inhalation respectively. On the venous side, that's opposite. We see the, uh, the blood fill the vein while we are exhaling, and then um, the vein emptying of blood while we're inhaling. So opposite, uh, but uh, sensible relative to uh, the anatomy and physiology of what's going on. Now, the more important understanding here is that the role of blood in the body is to, is to nourish the roughly 100 trillion cells that exist throughout the body and the brain. And nourishment of those cells occurs as a consequence of flow across the pervasive capillary membrane. You may know that this is roughly 25,000 miles of microscopic blood vessels throughout the body. And normally it is the heartbeat that creates differential pressure across the capillary membrane and facilitates this flow into the extracellular environment. But to that, we add roughly twice the mode of force and uh, differential pressure by adding the Valsalva wave component to, uh, to the exchange across this boundary and with that more fluid flow uh, into the extracellular environment and into the cells themselves. So um, everyone may generally understand that, uh, that breathing is a gas exchange function, but I argue strongly that it is a circulatory function. And if we think about it critically, we can easily recognize that gas exchange itself is a circulatory function in that gas is carried by the blood. So the bigger picture of what breathing is about is circulatory effectiveness or optimality. Now, if we pick apart the complex Valsalva wave that we saw earlier with filtering, what we see is two separate phenomena at work. Uh, the red uh, graph, the red line being the Valsalva wave rising and falling, rising with exhalation, falling with inhalation, and its consequence, the heartbeat rate. Um, the heartbeat rate is a, um, this is a, a, a graph uh, plotting the heartbeat rate over time, what is otherwise known as heart rate variability. It itself is not a wave, it's a mathematical abstraction, that being a graph of the heartbeat rate in time. And what happens is that as the diaphragm is moving up and down with depth and rhythmicity, it generates the blood wave, which propagates throughout the arterial tree, is, 
is detected by baroreceptors located throughout that arterial tree. And then the, uh, the heart rate synchronizes with that wave such that they have this 180 degree um, synchrony um, for as long as breathing is coherent. The uh, flight graph down below is a measure of the 180 degree synchrony. It's the uh, correlation coefficient of these two signals. And the more perfect they are in time and phase, the closer they will get to minus one. And here I mean 180 degree asynchrony. Um, here is a, uh, a screenshot that I took during my uh, six month period working on personal resonance protocol, and the, the uh, research for that and the writing of that book. Um, this is uh, my personal best that I achieved during that period where I would practice for 45 minutes every day for about six months to uh, continue to try to uh, realize my personal best. And uh, point, minus 0.98, is the best that I had achieved as of the time I sort of closed the book on, on that effort and went ahead and documented the Gantt personal resonance protocol. Uh, it is interesting to note that uh, realizing this, this um, uh, correlation coefficient of minus 0.98, the entire body mind must be under total control. And by that, I mean, uh, everything we do influences the ability to get to this point. Um, and what I found to be true is that while I have not simultaneously evaluated uh, this, but uh, what I found to be true uh, when I reached this point in my practice was this is essentially the same state as the awakened mind. It feels that way. Uh, it's a state of no thought. It's a state of total internal calm and um, um, relaxation. So not surprising to me uh, that the, the two are, are highly akin. Getting back to why alpha with the first breath. In 2009, uh, um, uh, Dr. Bob Grove suggested I give Herschel Tumum a call. Herschel and uh, Bob were uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and in 1999, uh, Herschel and Robert Marsh were awarded the US patent for hemoencephalography. And this is a technology that uses a near infrared LED to look through the, the bone of the skull into the brain such that the activity of blood can be assessed in the brain, uh, even through the skull. And that was the novelty and, uh, and the invention. And um, I did reach out to Herschel in roughly 2009, and um, he was familiar with uh, the Valsava wave. Bob and he had spoken about it, and uh, he had read my writings on the subject. And he said that he had, had used his HEG instrument to look for the Valsava wave in the brain, but had not found it. And uh, we talked for probably an hour in total, and we're musing over how that could be possible, given that it was visible virtually everywhere else on the head that the instrument could be attached. And his hypothesis at the time was that the, uh, for purposes of um, homeostasis, the brain micromanaged blood flow, even the heartbeat, um, such that blood flow through the brain was constant. And, uh, and uh, functioning of the brain depended on this constancy. But he said he, he wasn't entirely sure. The subject of low frequency filtering did come up in that this is what enabled us to see the Valsalva wave uh, with uh, Valsalva wave Pro is to eliminate low frequency filtering that had been built into the instrument uh, early on and is true for uh, early EEG instruments and and biofeedback instruments even now. Um, 
So uh, this continued to be a needle in my mind. And uh, in roughly 2011, Tato Sakadze moved to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and his office on the U of L campus, uh, U of L School of Medicine, Department of Psychophysiology, was about uh, four blocks from my father's home, uh, conveniently enough. So uh, I'd visit my dad for uh, a week or 10 days every six months or so. And when I did, I would, uh, I would make sure I made an appointment with Tato. And uh, we would spend a couple of hours together talking about our respective research and results and um, muse over uh, a few questions. And of course, the question burning in my mind was, how can the Valsaba wave exist throughout the body and in particular on the head and uh, organs of the head and face, but not be visible in the EEG. And he agreed that that was a, uh, that was a question worth answering. So together we hatched what uh, I've referred to as the search for the wave in the brain, where we would, uh, he would use um, uh, EEG and his experimentation, um, and I would use HEG in my experimentation. But this time we would use instruments that did not have any low frequency filtering, such that if the wave were present in the brain, it would appear. So here uh, are graphics sort of uh, showing what, what uh, Tato's arrangement looked like uh, at UofL and uh, what my arrangement looked like here in my office. His involving 128 channel um, wideband EEG and Valsava wave at the earlobe and mine involving HEG uh, at the forehead, HEG uh, instrument is designed to look right into the forehead at the brain and uh, Valsava wave pro attached to my earlobe. And then we would uh, correlate the results between the two. This was the goal. <clears throat> this is a, uh, an initial record. Go back for a moment. Uh, note that the uh, client on the left is observing coherence clock while her EEG and Valsaba wave are being recorded. This is the same recording that we used at the beginning and is also available on the Coherent Breathing channel on YouTube. Now, this is uh, an initial recording from uh, Tato's client. This happens to be 10 breaths per minute as she's starting out uh, coherent breathing um, in her instrumented condition and is initially breathing at 10 breaths per minute in that she's dividing coherent coherence clock by two, exhaling from 12 to three, inhaling from three to six, exhaling from six to nine, and inhaling from nine to 12. And here we see very large waves, electrical waves now in the EEG as detected by uh, the 128 channel EEG machine. Note that the amplitude of these waves are 137 microvolts. Um, this is roughly 20 times the amplitude of the functional bands we saw earlier on uh, D's instrument, a J and J neurodata. And that's characteristic of the functional bands. They're much, much lower in amplitude and therefore are clobbered by the, by the very large uh, physiologic signal of the breathing induced EEG in the brain. There's a story about that that I'll tell a little later on. Um, here is a second record of his client now breathing at 10 breaths per minute, then doing a breath hold and then resuming uh, coherent breathing using coherence clock. So here in the beginning, we see very large waves again beginning to show up um, here they're measured at uh, 90 microvolts, um, still very large relative to functional band amplitudes. And then comes a, a deep inhalation and a breath hold. 
that lasts for about 18 seconds. And then she lets uh, the breath hold go and begins, uh, resumes breathing. So here we see very large waves rise in the EEG, then the EEG, EEG roughly flat lines by comparison, and then very large waves rising again. Now here is the Valsava wave record on the client's earlobe. Here is exhalation and then a deep inhalation, Valsava wave uh, falling during inhalation. And then the breath hold starts. That's this period of roughly 18 seconds right here where we don't see very much wave activity in the Valsava wave record during that time. I snipped that out and overlaid that precisely on the EEG record that uh, I showed previously. And you can see the correlation here. Here is um, normal coherent breathing. Here is a deep inhalation and followed by the breath hold. Here we see the Valsava wave roughly flattening out over time and the EEG again, uh, relatively flatlining compared to the record of coherent breathing, which is beginning again here. So the evidence from this experimentation is that if we remove the low frequency filtering from the EEG instrument, we can see very large electrical waves rise in the EEG that correlate with those waves at the earlobe. Here is a frequency domain view of the same. And here we see a number of electrodes uh, of the set of 128 um, demonstrating um, peaking out here frequency wise at 0 0.085 Hertz, the, uh, the precise rate of the coherent breathing method. So again, the conclusion here is that if we, we remove low frequency filtering from the EEG, we see very large waves rising and falling in the EEG that by and large correlate with those at the earlobe observed with Valsalva wave probe. On to my experimentation involving uh, the simultaneous record of Valsalva wave at the earlobe and uh, hemoencephalography at the forehead. Um, these are um, precise simultaneous records recorded together uh, during the period of roughly one minute. And you can see from uh, just observing what's going on, on here between the wave actions um, that there is very strong correlation between the two records. Um, and again, um, very firm evidence that uh, both uh, EEG and HEG see uh, significant records or, or significant evidence of blood flow uh, as a consequence of breathing. Uh, this research at large was presented uh, by myself um, at the 2013 ISNR annual conference in Dallas. Interestingly, coincident with our uh, search for the wave in the brain, uh, the University of Rochester was involved in a project titled uh, A Parabascular Pathway Facilitates C uh, CSF Flow Through the Brain Parenchyma and the Clearance of Interstitial Solutes, including amyloid beta. Uh, the importance of this is amyloid beta is implicated uh, in Alzheimer's as one of the solutes that builds up in the brain, ultimately uh, leading to the destruction of neurons. So this was, uh, this was a very uh, important uh, finding in, in the very uh, same time frame. Um, here's my uh, explanation and summary of, of what they found. Using uh, radioactive markers uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid, they were able to see the pathways that CNF uh, takes through the, uh, the tissue of the brain um, from uh, 
one side to the other from effectively the, the arterial side of the blood flow to the venous side of the blood flow. And what they found was that there are literally channels that were not known to exist before, what they call paravascular spaces that are within and around the arterial structures and venous structures of the brain that facilitate flow of cerebrospinal fluid coincident with the heartbeat. In other words, the, the differential pressure between the arterial side of the blood supply to the brain and the venous uh, side of, of blood uh, <clears throat> return from the brain conduct uh, cerebrospinal fluid as a consequence of pressure differential between the two. And they, they uh, identified the heartbeat as the primary uh, mode of force for that differential pressure and flow. There is no mention in this research paper regarding um, a respiratory arterial pressure wave or any changes in pressure differential and flow as a consequence of breathing. So in my view, knowledge that the brain experiences the wave changes everything. It changes the physiology uh, behind the awakened mind and what the awakened mind argues regarding human potential. Um, it generally enlightens us regarding brain health and, and the high performance mind. Um, it enlightens us regarding learning. Uh, what does the wave in the brain mean to learning? Again, people that are not breathing with significant depth or ryth rhythmicity demonstrate no wave <clears throat> anywhere in the body. Uh, what is demonstrated is a is virtually a steady heartbeat, where the um, the diaphragm is really charged with then generating. Uh, this larger circulatory um, wave action and is completely evident when we exercise. If it were not for the ability of the thoracic pump and the diaphragm to facilitate a greater blood flow, then it would be impossible for us to um, exercise and exert muscular force and that that requires energy, which requires hydration and uh, gas exchange to for energy generation. Um, I think it sheds light on, on neuroplasticity from a psychophysiological perspective. That is practitioners that work with clientele using functional bands and other forms of biofeedback. Uh, I argue that if your client is breathing coherently, um, that you'll find that uh, they are much more adaptive, whether they're conscious of that adaptability or not, and are much more open, receptive, and pliant when it comes to, uh, to, to change, uh, either via psychological or psychophysiological counseling. And lastly, it tells us, I think, a lot about, about brain health and longevity, and as well as heart health and longevity. I've argued for a long time that it is the role of the diaphragm to offload the right heart uh, specifically as it relates to venous return, where uh, it is not the job of the right heart to act as a vacuum pump and bring venous blood back to the chest. Uh, it is the job of the diaphragm and inhalation to generate a relatively negative pressure in the thoracic cavity to which of venous blood naturally returns. Now, how did we end up here? We ended up here um, uh, on a professional level because uh, low frequency filtering was put in EEG machines early on to eliminate what was considered physiologic noise at that time because they uh, were so large that they uh, made it impossible to observe the functional bands uh, with detail. So if we filter out the um, everything below, um, let's say 0.5 Hertz, then uh, we don't see any uh, of this electrical effect 
as a consequence of the blood volume rising and falling uh, in the brain due to breathing. This and because uh, we've not been taught um, about the circulatory system at large, uh, that is the big picture function of circulation in the body and how it works, and that breathing itself is a critical component of uh, the circulation of blood and fluid in the body. Now, I made the argument in 2013, and uh, uh, I'll present it here again, that, that um, there is an evolutionary theory of the diaphragm. I've gone back and looked at, at uh, snakes and uh, reptiles and amphibians uh, as they uh, become more vertical. Um, and uh, this in, includes uh, uh, mammals as well. And it turns out that the, that the sophistication and control of the diaphragm evolves with verticality. And as humans holding our brains above our chests, um, we are in effect vertical when we are seated or standing. And um, when we are seated or standing, it's, uh, it's imperative that the diaphragm contribute blood flow uh, or motive force to, to the, the circulation of blood in the body such that blood is brought from the extremities of the feet and the hands, legs and arms to the chest during inhalation offloading the right heart of that responsibility, and then sending blood to the brain during exhalation, uh, where the heart itself would otherwise have to push blood up to the brain beat by beat, and through the brain uh, beat by beat. Uh, this is the role of the thoracic pump, uh, as, as mentioned previously. Now it turns out that the giraffe is the quintessential example of this theory. And um, I had the opportunity in 2017 at the invitation of the Dallas Zoo to use Valsalva Way Pro to instrument a 12 year old female giraffe by the name of Jade uh, during a minor veterinary procedure, but one that required that she had to be sedated for a brief period of time and during that period, I got about 15 minutes of opportunity to observe what the blood flow in Jade's tongue looked like um, with, uh, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, I attached the instrument to the very tip of her tongue, which was hanging down right in front of my face. My, my own face was uh, no more than about one foot away from her nostrils which are, are large and full of hair. Uh, the reason for this is that the giraffe's uh, inhalation and exhalation is so powerful that it sounds like a freight train. And if the nostrils were not full of hair, uh, bugs and uh, debris would enter the, uh, the respiratory tract of the giraffe with every inhalation. It's like a very powerful vacuum cleaner going off with every inhalation. So here I was in front of Jade with Valsalva Way Pro clipped to the tip of her tongue, which was flaccid at the time. And from the very moment I attached it, I saw what I thought I would see. Um, the background on this is that the giraffe circulatory physiology has been a mystery to scientists from the beginning of science. And the reason for this is that the giraffe heart is no larger than the heart of any other land-dwelling vertebrate relative to body mass. But physics say that the giraffe heart cannot move blood to the giraffe's brain uh, to the extent that the giraffe can even exist. So it's been a puzzling matter for a hundred years. And um, many giraffes have been sacrificed to science trying to understand how this can be. Now, I argue that two facts have been overlooked uh, in their pursuit. One fact is that breathing plays a vital role in the circulation of blood and fluid throughout the body. 
uh, this general idea is absent in their research. The, uh, the second major fact is that the giraffe has the largest diaphragm of any land dwelling mammal. Now one has to ask the question, why should that be true? And this is what prompted my interest, of course, having uh, initially discovered the Valsalva wave and understanding its relevance to blood flow in the head. Now, um, um, it was on my short list of things to do to be able to observe uh, what the blood in the head of a giraffe looked like. And thank you to the Dallas Zoo for allowing me that opportunity. Now, that record looks like this. Uh, this is, again, Valsalva wave ear clip attached to the tip of Jade's tongue, which is the only location I had to observe in that everything else was covered with hair and largely inaccessible. Her lips were too thick and hairy, and uh, the tongue was the only opportunity. And I did, really didn't have much time to look around. I had to be in and out before uh, Jade came to from, from her uh, sedation. Um, each one of the waves that we see here is um, a rise in the blood volume in Jade's tongue. And um, these were occurring both when she exhaled, as we would expect, and when she inhaled, which is what I anticipated would be true and did get to see in uh, each record that I recorded. So this confirms to me that the evolution of the giraffe diaphragm is purposeful and, uh, and plays the role of allowing the giraffe to be so tall and its neck and head and brain uh, to be so far above its chest that <clears throat> its diaphragm and thoracic cavity, thoracic pump has evolved to the extent where it brings blood to the giraffe's brain, not just during exhalation, as it seems to for humans, but also during inhalation. So allowing blood flow to be relatively constant through the giraffe's brain at all times, circumstances permitting. Now, the math associated with this is down below. I won't bore, bore you with that, but the bottom line is that the, uh, the frequency of the waves we see here in the recording are roughly twice those that were observed audibly and visually by me where uh, no audible or visual recording was allowed by zoo personnel. So I didn't have those to match up to this, but I timed it on a stopwatch. And uh, if we divide this by two, it matches her audible and visual breathing. So bottom line is that, um, that the giraffe has evolved and the thoracic pump mechanism in the giraffe has evolved to facilitate blood flow to its brain by the heartbeat um, as it's beating and pushing blood up the carotid artery and also by the thoracic pump, which is moving a large volume of blood out of the giraffe lungs um, out through the left heart and up the carotid artery along with the heartbeat to the giraffe's brain. Uh, um, gravity working to pull blood down all the time from the giraffe's head. And then as the giraffe inhales, it's creating such a powerful vacuum uh, reflected in the head of the giraffe that it helps pull arterial blood up the carotid artery to the brain. So, um, the brain is experiencing blood flow both during exhalation and inhalation. This um, I'll leave you with. This is a graphic of Valsalva wave crow. And um, it is, uh, you can see that it's recording about 30 seconds worth of, of Valsalva wave being read and corresponding heart rate being blue, uh, the valsalva wave leading the heart rate in that it is the instigator 
for changes in heart rate via vera, vera reception and autonomic governance uh, via the uh, vagal nerve of the sinoatrial node in, in the heart. And here we have the uh, resonance curve of Valsable Vals wave uh, Pro 2.0 uh, wandering down here below the suitable threshold down uh, approximating uh, minus one. And with that, I'll click on this graphic and you can see what this looks like live. This happens to be uh, Taylor Elliott uh, recording uh, uh, simultaneous, this is the resonance simultaneous selection on the instrument, which shows us uh, both the Valsava wave in red and the heart rate, uh, the heartbeat rate in blue, otherwise known as heart rate variability. Uh, in this case, he is listening to two bells, not practicing a personal resonance protocol per se, but uh, eyes closed listening to two bells. And I will leave you there. Thank you very much for your interest. And uh, I wish you wellness.